I am the father of two beautiful children who had genetic diseases, so that means that I spent a lot of time learning about mutations. I had been taught in school that nearly all mutations were haphazard, but when I learned more about the nature of mutations, I realized that this was wrong. What we learned in school is that our body is controlled by genes. Genes are DNA code that are inherited according to Mendel's laws, dominant, recessive, that sort of thing. Genes code for proteins, which do all the work of the cell. Genes change by mutation, which is a change in the DNA sequence. We are taught that mutations are caused by copying errors and other accidental sources, and that mutations are mostly bad, but the few good ones are kept through natural selection. The problem is that the mutation rate that we observe is so high that if mutations were accidental, natural selection couldn't keep up, and life would degenerate by collecting bad mutations that couldn't be removed. So where did this idea that mutations are accidents come from? Well, first we discover the gene, then we discover mutations which modify the gene. Then we learn that external changes, such as cutting the tails off mice, were not heritable, but that radiation can cause changes to occur which are heritable but arbitrary. Well, this all led to the random mutation hypothesis, which says that mutations do not occur with respect to the needs of the organism, but occur more or less haphazardly. This idea influenced several generations of biologists. This was all before the discovery of DNA. When we hit the DNA revolution, we learned what genes were made of. DNA is sequenced into genes which code for proteins. But we carried into the DNA revolution the idea that mutations were random. So when you combine these hypotheses, it led to the expectation that there would be a lot of evolutionary leftovers from accidental sequence changes. So it was thought that much of the DNA in your cell would be junk. So, when they later found repetitive DNA, mobile DNA, and pseudogenes which looked like genes but didn't code for proteins, it was assumed that this was leftover junk from random mutations. But what we are learning now is a different story. We are learning that the cell is a technological wonder with numerous nanomachines which work together in a tightly integrated manner. This caused a number of people to reconsider our concept of mutations. Were we possibly wrong? Well, we discovered several things. First, we found that mutations are usually targeted at tissue-specific genes, not the housekeeping genes that keep the cell running. Tissue-specific genes are the ones that will most likely benefit from modification as the environment changes. We also learned that mutations can be induced. If you starve E. coli from its normal sugar and grow it in the presence of a different kind of sugar, a specific DNA sequence is inserted in just the right place to turn on the genes needed to adapt. Your body creates antibodies to combat infection from antigens, but there are only a few hundred genes that code for millions of antibodies. So how does this work? All these antibodies are formed by cut and paste DNA. The few hundred genes are actually gene parts, which are grouped into buckets and each antibody cell cuts and pastes different parts from each bucket into a final gene. Thus, millions of antibodies are made by continually recombining just a few hundred gene parts. After this cut and paste process, when an antigen comes in, the closest matching antibody is refined to make a better fit by mutating the antibody gene. So this mutation process is entirely focused on one gene. So the genome is about 3 billion base pairs. The antibody gene is only 1,200 base pairs. All the mutations go to the antibody. Not only that, they go to the right part of the antibody. The mutations are focused on the part of the antibody that attaches to the antigen. Repetitive, repetitive DNA works like a tuning knob for cell functions and body structures. In dogs, a single repeat segment controls the amount of bend in its nose. Repetitive DNA mutates primarily by changing the length of the repeat, which adjusts the value of a parameter. Pseudogenes look like broken pieces of protein coding DNA. However, some pseudogenes can be used as templates to copy new functional modules into other genes. Bacteria use these modules to alter their surface proteins to evade detection. All this leads to the idea that mutations are often informationally directed, not haphazard. The cell is pre-coded with information which directs the mutation process towards useful mutations and away from harmful ones. As I learned about these amazing adaptive processes, I realized that just as hearts of heart attacks, 
So the mutation processes designed to help life adapt can also have diseases, but they are the exception rather than the rule.